Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure. I introduce myself. I'm Gerald Elbers. I'm the mayor of the city of Lloydminster, Alberta, Saskatchewan. I also have the uh, honor of being the director of protocol for the Lloydminster Heavy Oil Show 2024. It's an absolute pleasure to have had Premier Smith and Premier Moe, the two premiers of my two favorite provinces, here beside me for the day, last day today as well as uh, last night. So I'll turn it to the media and I'll step aside because I'm sure you'll want to start with questions for the Premier. Brian. Sorry, thanks everyone for joining us. Ryan, I Ron think you from Pipeline Online. Uh, this is for both premiers. The Pipeline, or, sorry, Pathways Alliance plans on bringing CO2 down from uh, Port McMurray down into the Cold Lake area. Saskatchewan's been doing CO2 at the uh, Enhanced Oil Recovery waiver since 2000. We've been doing it for 24 years. We've also been doing it around the EDAM area since at least 2008. The Husky have done that. Why aren't we using that CO2 for enhanced oil recovery instead of just geological storage? Well, because the federal government won't allow it. Uh, under the, the federal government uh, carbon capture credit, they've specifically excluded enhanced oil recovery. Now, we haven't. We brought through a, a credit that allows for, uh, for it to be used for enhanced oil recovery, and we'll continue talking with the federal government to try to get them to be reasonable about it. But I think you're quite right. The, the fact that they have, uh, the industry has already found a use for, for CO2 that has a productive value to it and, and gives a, the ability to enhance production and have the revenue stream associated with it. That's the kind of thing that you're, you're looking at, at, uh, at being able to see more of. Um, well, Saskatchewan's ahead of us. They, I'll let the Premier talk about what, what they've managed to do, but we have our Shell Quest project and we also have our carbon trunk line, both of which combined have managed to sequester safely 11 and a half million barrels of CO2 and will continue to, to uh, sequester at a rate of two to three million, uh, uh, million tons for, um, for the foreseeable future. So I would say that, uh, that this is one of the, the ways in which we could use CO2 to be able to not only reduce emissions, but also to continue to enhance the production in the industry. And I, I uh, would, ag would agree with everything Premier Smith said, and I would just say, you know, this is really quite a travesty, actually, that there isn't at least a split rate on uh, how you're going to use the CO2. It makes uh, our nation and our, the, the, the industries that are, the players that are operating in our oil and gas industry in Canada uncompetitive with uh, uh, just those uh, on the south side of the 49th parallel in the U.S. where they have the 45Q and the split rate program of which we're familiar with because as Premier Smith said and you did in your question, we, we have a, uh, I'm an active enhanced oil recovery field down in the Weyburn Mineale area where they're utilizing not only the carbon off of our coal-fired Boundary Dam 3 plant, but that isn't enough carbon for them to satisfy the, the, the carbon, uh, uh, the enhanced oil recovery opportunity that they have. So they're also purchasing uh, carbon dioxide, American carbon dioxide from the gasification plant in North Dakota, built the pipeline up into Canada and they're sequestering uh, not only our Canadian CO2, but American CO2 in that field. And I would say uh, that the, the companies that are involved in that are one largely is the only net zero oil company that's operating in Canada and likely uh, to my knowledge in North America and so uh, this is a missed opportunity by the federal government by not at least uh, addressing uh, the benefits of enhanced oil recovery and I it concerns me that uh, you know possibly there's uh, another policy outcome that they are uh, trying to get to as a federal government um, I would say that that's not the proper the competitive policy outcome for families that work in the oil field families in this part of the world um, but it's also not the proper policy outcome of of, uh, of transitioning out of oil and gas, which I fear is the, the federal government's uh, goal. It's not the right outcome for energy security in Canada and North America, nor is it the right outcome for global citizens uh, when we actually have the, the, uh, the opportunity uh, to have proper policy in place and provide even more sustainable and ethical oil and gas uh, to people uh, on earth. And I think that is a, a, the travesty of the entire situation and it's a missed opportunity. Uh, it's one that might be corrected after the next federal election. Sir, follow up, Premier Mo, uh, in your uh, provincial budget here this last spring, you announced the most collateral program. Uh, in the last week, there was five rigs working within eight miles of the Lloydminster upgrader. That's more than I've seen in 10 years in that area. It's reinvigorated coal production. That's not thermal in this area. And I've talked to a driller, uh, drilling contractor in the southeast of Saskatchewan. Almost all the wells are drilling on most laterals now. Mm -hmm. Please speak. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is uh, this was a this was a suggestion that came from industry. Uh, you know, I spoke uh, in our, our 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 session here about the the importance of the relationship between industry 
uh, and government. And I think we have a, that solid relationship between industry and the Alberta government, the Saskatchewan government, and, 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 and the, the relationship between the, the provincial governments as well. Is, you know, is, and we talk about cooperation. Co cooperation. Co co <laughs> uh, you know, there is some competition on attracting the investment dollars, but more importantly, and you see this on full display at this show, when you see the innovation that's coming forward from the industry, uh, the, the, the innovation that not only is uh, providing us the opportunity to increase production, um, but providing us the opportunity to pr produce even a cleaner product uh, today and into the future. It's, it's quite encouraging, I hope, for all of those in the industry. It's encouraging for me uh, as a part of government. Um, and I think it encourages me to ensure that uh, we as a government, and if we have the honour to continue to form government in just a few weeks as we head to an election, um, that we continue to listen to industry when they come forward with the real solutions that are allowing us to produce more of that sustainable product and make it available to more Canadians, more North Americans and more people globally. That's, that's the goal of this government and that's why we have a, a plan for growth target of increasing our oil production in Saskatchewan because we believe it is the most sustainable and ethical product that you can find on earth. We want all Canadians and invite all Canadians to be proud of not only what we produce and how we produce it, and we most certainly think we should be producing more of it and making it available uh, to more people. Thank you, Premier. Other questions from the media? Yes, ma'am. Premier Smith. Um, mm -hmm. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, Michelle Belfontaine, CBC in Alberta. Um, Premier Smith, we learned a couple of weeks ago that Nate Horner is another member of your cabinet that accepted hockey tickets for the Oilers' playoffs. And he declined to say who else uh, accepted the tickets. And of course, we know about uh, Nate Middorf, Mike Ellis, and Joseph Scout. Who else on your cabinet accepted playoff tickets? I don't know. I, I have mentioned that I accepted three. I went to Explore Edmonton, I went to the Oilers, and I also went to, um, a, uh, at, the, uh, at the hosting of uh, a board member for Invest Alberta. Okay, so when, when reporters reach out to the individual press secretaries for your ministers, they get referred to your office. So I'm wondering how it is that you don't know which members of your cabinet accepted these tickets? Well, because the relationship that each member has on it, on these issues is with the ethics commissioner. And so I expect that every single one of them are going to follow the rules. And the, the rules is uh, that you can accept as a matter of social protocol um, and uh, that you have to disclose. And, 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 to and, I, and I would year. expect and I would expect that they would have done so. So we would have to wait until next year to find out. They, um, you can contact the office of the ethics commissioner to find out how he does his reporting, but they don't report to me. They report to him, and I expect them all to follow the rules. Uh, Premier Smith, Sean Amato with City News. Um, you brought up uh, Keystone XL and Northern Gateway uh, in the room just now. Donald Trump said a lot of things last night, but uh, he said Keystone XL at least twice, I believe. <laughs> so what is your level of confidence that either of those projects are revived and then actually get Look, I mean, Alberta's going to have a great relationship with America, regardless of who is in the White House. I think our conversation changes a, a little bit, uh, depending on, on whether it's Republican White House or Democrat White House. If it's Republican, then uh, clearly we would have a conversation about restarting the uh, discussion around Keystone and any other egress for oil. If it continues to be the Democrats, I think there's a fruitful conversation that we can have about how we would enhance the the, uh, the, the export of, of natural gas as a precursor to some of the, the new economy around hydrogen. So I, I feel confident r regardless of who's there. We have a, a great relationship with America. Your predecessor, uh, Jason Kenney, lost a lot of Albertans' money on the previous version mm. of Keystone XL. What do you think of that? Will taxpayers, are you willing to put some taxpayers' money into either Northern Gateway, Keystone XL? Uh, would you do that again? Look, I, um, I know that there were a number, I mean, when you look at what happened with the federal government having to step in, having created an environment where no project would go ahead without some kind of de-risking from the government, I think we need to change the regulatory process. We need to give confidence to industry that when they commence a project, that there's some reasonable period of time where they can accept it, expect that it's going to be completed. And so uh, that's, I think, the, the, the objective. That's part of the reason why we campaigned and uh, did a legal action against C-69. It's part of the reason why we need to see a rewrite of the, the rules around pipeline approvals. And so I would hope that we'd be able to create an environment where government doesn't have to step in and de-risk, but it'll, it'll require some regulatory changes. So yes, no, you're still thinking about, about that? If it I, I would say that, uh, look, if, if, if we have the same kind of environment that we have today, then it's a moot point because I don't think there's any private sector company 
in the current environment that would be willing to take the risk on, on, putting, on putting it forward. So what we're talking with the energy companies about or the pipeline companies about is how do you maximize the pipeline egress capacity on your existing pipes? Can you do loops? Can you do compression? Can you um, expand in other ways uh, your, your existing capacity? And I think that's a very fruitful discussion. And I think we do already have the ability to increase our egress. Um, we, we've been told as much as six million barrels a day. We're currently doing four million barrels a day. So I think we have the ability to expand without having to have the conversation immediately about pipelines. But I, I think that um, we need to fix the regulatory environment. Hi, uh, Edmonton City Council got a report yesterday uh, from Edmonton Police Commission debating whether or not uh, elected officials belong in the commission hmm. or if they should be replaced with a point of public. I'm just wondering where your government Well, look, I mean, we had uh, changed our legislation to give uh, provincial oversight because the province is responsible for creating a policing environment. And so we do appoint to various police commissions, but we don't appoint politicians. So I think it's, uh, I think there's some wisdom in them looking at that as, as a model. I think that there's an important connection that, that councils need to have with their police commissions. But we thought it was important to make sure that we have the ability to appoint, but not for it not to be elected people. Well, look, I mean, we, uh, we, we know that in every community, uh, we were a bit taken by surprise by the number of people who moved to Alberta in 2023, and that every single school is facing these capacity issues. I, I spoke with one large school board yesterday, and they comfortably operate at 85% utilization. They're on now at 96% utilization. So we have uh, announced over the summer that we were going to be investing in more modulars as a stopgap measure, but there'll be more that we, that we are going to be announcing in the, in the coming weeks to be able to address that, short, that, uh, that need. It's, it's uh, acute and it's across the entire system. Are you able to expand on the more to come? September 17th, you'll learn more. Question for Premier Mo, Chris Burke, <coughs> Network. A lot of smaller urban municipalities rely on the energy sector, particularly in the southern part of the province. What message do you have for the mayors, the councillors, who are looking for a partner after your election, but also their election in November? Because they're looking for someone who's going to stand up to Ottawa, but also rely on someone in Regina to help them through infrastructure challenges, energy challenges, job challenges. What's your message to them today? Well, I, I would say you're going to see uh, everything that you have seen over the last number of years, whether that be the introduction and uh, increase of the municipal revenue sharing program we have, which is a no strings attached uh, transfer of dollars to municipalities, uh, long asked for or provided uh, by this government in the very early days. Um, when we came uh, out of the, the, the pandemic, uh, we had provided uh, for the second time, uh, only in the history of the province, uh, infrastructure dollars, municipal and economic enhancement program, it was called the MEAT program, but it was infrastructure dollars so that uh, municipalities across the province uh, were able to continue with some of the infrastructure plans that they had in what was a very challenging and uncertain environment in those years, and, and uh, Mayor Albers will uh, remember uh, those, uh, those days. Um, when it comes to standing up for Saskatchewan people in wherever uh, they live in the province, um, that is going to continue, and what we always do is extend our hand uh, because we would much rather work alongside and with the federal government on expanding the industries that are creating wealth in Saskatchewan communities, creating wealth for Saskatchewan families. I would say uh, similar industries creating wealth uh, on the other side of the border in Alberta as well. And we always want to work with the federal government to uh, enhance the opportunity for those industries which are the most sustainable industries in the world, and the most ethical in industries in the world, and we should be collectively so very proud of them as a federal government and as collectively as Canadians from coast to coast to coast. And I don't know that we have that powerful voice in our federal administri administration today. Um, we are over the four-year norm, norm of an election with a, a minority uh, government that uh, is threatening now to be propped up by a separatist party, which is a, a very um, unpredictable dynamic that we find ourselves in as a nation. Um, so we are going to find our way to a federal election soon. Um, all of the polls say there's likely going to be a change in that administration, and we would very quickly uh, extend uh, that invitation to work alongside the provinces. 
on uh, strengthening uh, the already uh, vibrant economies that we have, the provincial economies that collectively make a, a very strong Canadian economy. And to have one voice as we find our way to, in Saskatchewan's case to 162 countries that we export products to and to ensure that all Canadians are proud of not only what we are exporting and providing that food and energy security to each of those countries and the role that we play, uh, but we are proud of how we produce that product from an environmental perspective, from an ethical perspective, and how it creates wealth for each of us across this nation. And we're all connected uh, in, Canada, in, in Canada. We're Canadians first, and we should never forget that. Question for both of you, if you don't mind, and then I'm going to have a follow-up for Mayor Albers. But Weyburn, small nuclear energy reactor, there's potential talks of one up in the Peace Region in northern Alberta. Where does nuclear stand in the next four years, next five years? Is it a resource that you guys you want to tap go into, go or is it something that is we're waiting for the regulations from the federal government? Now, so where this started was a, uh, uh, three provinces, and then Alberta has signed on as well, but New Brunswick, Ontario, and, and Saskatchewan, New Brunswick and Ontario being nuclear uh, power provinces already, um, and Saskatchewan uh, soon uh, to quite likely uh, uh, choose uh, that technology, as we just simply don't have a lot of other options as we uh, find our way to uh, increase power usage, um, for whatever reason that might be, and the thirst for whether it be power, oil and gas, energy in general, uh, is real, uh, and it's in great in our province, a growing province like Alberta, but it's also great globally, and we have the opportunity uh, to provide uh, all of those products uh, collectively as Canadians to so many people uh, globally in turn, providing them with energy security. And so we've been looking very seriously and moving um, on at least one uh, SMR project and selected alongside uh, through the MOU with New Brunswick, Ontario, and now Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, the GE technology and moving forward through the, the federal regulatory process there that looks to be somewhere uh, upwards of 15 years. Uh, there are commitments and discussions about how we can bring that federal regulatory process down to well under 10 years, which I think would really decrease the cost of this uh, very much needed technology as we move forward. Um, so that's step one, I think, in this conversation. I think step two is uh, building on that memorandum of understanding and thankful for Alberta's uh, um, commitment and, and, and positioning and being part of that conversation because the energy electricity needs in Alberta are increasing as well as you see uh, industries in both of our respective provinces that are expanding at record rates and really leading Canada when it comes to uh, industry expansion, economic growth, attra investment attraction and nowhere is that more significant and evident than right here uh, in, in Lloyd Minster. And so there's going to be a need for more power and I think there's opportunities uh, for us uh, should we have the honour of forming government in Saskatchewan uh, to really move forward on you know, what the next steps of that conversation might might mean in interties in uh, maybe large scale reactors at some point to satisfy the the emerging energy demands that we have, uh, but for sure uh, you know collaborating on on small modular reactor technology as well. As you know, we had the two locations uh, that we have been working on: one in Estevan, um, and one up closer to Lloyd Minster here. Uh, both requiring a, a water source and, and, and we remain uh, with those two locations as potentials because we're not sure that the conversation is going to end uh, at Estevan. It may uh, go beyond that um, and with that the, the, the partnerships I think are very, very uh, evident and that's a conversation that should happen. Yeah. Well, just give uh, credit to, to Mayor Albers because he has been talking about the potential for having a partnership and Lloyd Minster being a bit of a nexus for that on nuclear since I first met him. And, and so a couple of the ways I'm looking at it is, number one, that Saskatchewan's already further ahead of us on a regulatory environment because they have uranium, and I believe they have historic environmental permits or at least a regulatory process to bring it on stream. We don't have that yet in Alberta because we've never had nuclear. I think the only thing we have is a medical isotope um, op, um, lab in, in uh, University of Alberta. So we have to figure out a regulatory environment to bring it on grid. And if we can piggyback on Saskatchewan's regulatory process with an intertie so that we can then import that so that we would be able to expand and, and speed up the process, we are very keen to do that. The second part, though, is the rollout of small modular reactors sounds to me like something that our industrial sites want to do. I'm watching very closely with Dow Chemical because in Texas they're, I think, very close to rolling out the first one. And once, uh, once you see that happen in Texas, I suspect that it will replicate uh, across that state and then it will prove the technology out very quickly. And then again, if we can work collaboratively with the federal government to shorten the time frame on that, then I think we could, we could roll it out. That being said, everyone in the industry I talk to talks about a minimum 10-year regulatory approval process. That takes us to call it 2035. 
we know that we need to increase our energy production a thousand megawatts a year. So we have 10,000 megawatts of power we're going to have to bring on in this next short period. And for us, the most practical way to bring that on, the most efficient way to bring that on, the most reliable way to bring that on, the most affordable way to bring that on is natural gas. So that's what we'll be looking at doing for the next decade. Sure, last question for Mayor Elbers. It's not every day that you get to sit down with at least one premier, but you get the opportunity today to sit down with two premiers. What's your conversations like with the two premiers, and can you tell us anything that's coming out of the discussions that you're having today? Well, uh, thank you for the question. It's a real opportunity to host both premiers. Anyone that's familiar with our community realizes we are a bi-provincial city, the one and only city in Canada that sits in two provinces. We, call it, we look to both provinces for, and Premier Mo talked about, that sustainable funding to operate the municipality. We receive funding from the government of Alberta. We also receive various funding streams. So it's a great opportunity to bring them together. And I can say that uh, in our brief discussions, because we've had a chance to chat with a lot of people today, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Premier Moe's facing an election in October. Uh, myself and my council are facing an election in November. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, hopefully January to have a conversation with two premiers, two cabinets here in Lloydminster as early as hopefully January, February, as I look back at both of these folks and hope we can pull that off. The opportunities are huge to get both governments, as we were talking about, we heard about Saskelta just a little while ago, or sorry, Sask. Yeah. Sasberta. Sasberta. Saskelta is the one I'll make we the recommendation. Have yeah, okay. <laughs> I won't even tackle that one. Thank you, Premier. The opportunities are immense. And if you can make legislation and governance work at a provincial level in Lloydminster, you can make it work in any one of the two provinces. Certainly, energy is the theme of today. And we've heard that from the ministers and the premiers. Uh, it's tremendous. We've heard it from the audience. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. I've heard there's excitement and coll towards collaboration and I appreciate that and I look forward to the future with them both. Mayor, we can't have one more question. Yep. Jerry Lampa, Let's stay with that municipal election because you've got Scott Moe's looking to win seats in Saskatchewan and but it still has a while to go with Danielle Smith but was there conversation on any of the pertinent files to Lloyd Minster either education, health, security? Was there any conversation on that, and maybe just on the health file alone? Certainly there were some brief discussions. Uh, I'll just take you back before these two fine premiers were able to join us. We hosted a meeting of the two provincial health ministers uh, late last year, uh, or earlier this year, and that was a great opportunity to lay some issues out, and I think we've got some direction from them. We would like to have those further conversations with the premiers, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day it ends up at the cabinet tables looking for money, treasury board, uh, because that's what it takes to, to move the needle in some cases. But we also have to make sure we have made a great case. And I think they're both open to hearing our case. I think we've got some great information to provide. We've watched the city grow basically double over the last 35 years. You won't find that many places in Saskatchewan, certainly in Alberta a few, but not many in Saskatchewan that have doubled their population, partly because of the investment in oil and gas industry. The upgrader is an example. Changed the face of this industry and this community. Changed the community to the better. And I think that here's the opportunity to do a refresh on a few things. Education works well. It's not perfect by any means. Our schools are challenged because we have a growing population, and we'll be talking more about that through the Ministers of Education, working with the school board. So we, we're looking at all avenues, and uh, I'm very optimistic about the future. I've heard that from both premiers. We've heard that talk. The energy of this show today and tomorrow demonstrates the energy we're going forward. And on the security file, I don't know if any of the premiers want to chip in on that because while Alberta pays for the RCMP bill, Saskatchewan hasn't paid us yet. Well, look, uh, what, what I would say is sometimes the fact that we have different election cycles makes it complicated. I, we weren't able to have some of these conversations because we went through an election and now we've got uh, both the mayor and, and the premier going through an election. But post-election, um, if the faces are the same, there's a commitment on all of us that we would like to meet again to talk about how we would work so that, because uh, if I have a three-year runway and the mayor and the premier have another four-year run runway, we have a lot of stability to be able to sort through some of these issues. As I understand it, uh, Saskatchewan runs the hospital system as part of a Saskatchewan health region, same with the schools, and then we also have an issue with policing. And the simplified way of, of operating this is that we would just have a funding arrangement where we figure out what the population base is and then we'd have a simplified formula to be able to pay our share. And I 
if that's not working well at the moment, then I'm committed to making sure that it does work well. Because this is a, a region that is vitally important to Alberta. It generates an awful lot of an awful lot of revenue is generated for our, our provincial government out of this region. We want to make sure that it's supported in all the things that people need to, um, to make a, a community vibrant. You need to have good schools. You need to have a, a good hospital. You need to have, feel safe in your community. And so if, if, if we need to do some more work on that funding formula, we're, we're absolutely committed to doing that. Yeah, I would uh, just say uh, policing was a switch from F to K division uh, some time ago. When it comes uh, probably more pertinent to today's uh, conversation is around uh, education and, and health care and how, um, although not entirely unique, there's very few places like Lloydminster uh, that straddle a, a border just like this. We have uh, the same but different in Creighton and Flintlawn uh, on the other side of Saskatchewan. I say the same but different because it's two communities on each side of the borders, but similar, um, some similar challenges. I think this is a space where, I think this is a commitment that, that at least I would provide today, and uh, is to have a conversation around what would work best for the community as we move forward when it comes to education and health care, to ensure that it's simple, uh, to ensure that uh, you know, people in the community aren't dealing maybe with two systems from time to time and to provide some, some certainty for community leadership, whether that be at the school division level, whether that be uh, with the health services that are being offered. Um, we've had you know, many conversations around ambulance service, those kinds of things over uh, the last number of years. And so I, the first thing I would say is this is not a conversation that has just started today. This has been an ongoing conversation. I mean, it needs to continue to be an ongoing conversation. And then the, the second point I would say uh, to all of that is uh, we're here to listen and, and to work with the community on what works best for the people that live here. Because as Mayor Albert said, uh, this is a community that has doubled in population, uh, desperately trying to build capacity in both that health care system and that education system like we are in a number of other communities. I think we're about 20 or 25 schools that are in uh, process of being built uh, as, as we speak um, and, and, and need more. Um, it's just a, an example of, of what's happening in you know, two of the fastest growing provinces in the nation of Canada today. Um, so we should, uh, you know, be, be fortunate and count our blessings that we do live in that part of the nation of Canada that is generating wealth for, for all Canadians and generating wealth for people that live uh, in our respective provinces and more locally generating wealth and uh, providing opportunity for people that live in Lloydminster and choose, uh, will choose to live here in the future. Um, but we'd be here to listen as to, you know, what does this look like moving forward? We know what it's looked like uh, in, in the past. What does this look like moving forward and what is in the best interest of the people that live here today and are going to live here tomorrow? And I think we're open to that conversation. Um, I would be open to it uh, should I be successful in uh, a provincial election here in a few weeks. I'd be open to it as well if I wasn't successful, but it might not be as an impactful as a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm an Alberta. Due to time, I'm afraid, I think. Can you just tell us why that project came off the rails there briefly and what is Alberta willing to fund going forward? Look, the, the, the project started off as a 46-kilometer route that would cost $4.4 .4 billion. Everyone was excited about it. And it's the incredible shrinking project. Every time uh, a new announcement came out, it got smaller and smaller, and it did not meet its original commitment. And so when we looked at the latest one, which saw a ridership loss of 40% and an increase in cost of 14%, and it still uh, wasn't scoped out to the, the full cost, we just thought this, uh, at some point we've got to rethink this. And so we've had a I've had a conversation with the mayor and I've told her I'm absolutely committed to the original vision of the project, which was to get the service as far south as we possibly can and as far north as we possibly can. It doesn't mean it needs to be a single project. That's uh, what uh, has become very clear in some of the reporting that's been done is that that is where the costs have been incurred, is trying to tunnel under a city where you have massive underground rivers and the complexity of going about doing that. So what we um, have committed to doing is asking an engineering firm to give us an alternate route. See, um, if we start at where the event center is going to be, um, also with a future union station in mind, how far south can we go? How much would it cost and how do we get there? And then let's talk about using, a, and I've committed to the mayor that once we get that back, um, we'll bring it to them and see if they're committed to continuing to partner with us on that. We've reached out to our federal counterparts as well to let them know that that's the approach that we would like to take. And then the second phase of that, we'll see what would be the alignment for us to be able to serve North, um, North Calgary as well. And it may be that using the Deerfoot Valley on the route to the airport and then further up to Airdrie, which is one of the things we want to do using the existing CP rail line, maybe that's the best way to serve North Calgary. 
I think we have to keep an open mind, but there, I, think, I think when Calgarians looked at that project, and they're seeing that it's now costing, um, essentially, uh, if they were to build that out at that rate, it would cost $20 billion to build that entire line at the per kilometer rate we're seeing now. That, 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 that is the kind of project that could bankrupt a city. And we want to make sure that we're getting cost effective public transit, and then I think we just have to do it a different way. So that's why we needed to rethink on it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Mayor? Okay.